Financial Advisor, I'd like to welcome you to this month's Spared Wealth Strategies webinar. Our topic today is going to focus on the markets going into 2023. I'm joined today by Baird's Investment Strategy Analyst, Ross Mayfield, for an informational discussion around how to prepare for the markets in 2023 with topics including the U.S. labor market, monetary policy changes, and more. For those of you unfamiliar with Ross, Ross is an investment strategy analyst on Baird's PWM equity and fixed income research team. He's a CFA professional who works closely with financial advisors to educate clients about the economy and markets. In addition, he creates investment strategy content aimed at helping clients achieve their long-term financial goals. Before I turn the call over to him, I do have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to highlight. For optimal viewing, we would suggest setting your layout to the side-by-side -side view via the circle in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. All participants are in a listen-only mode, but we would love to hear from you. So we will host a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar to address as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Just please be sure that when you submit the question, you're submitting it to all panelists. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available along with the slide deck about a week following today's presentation. You can obtain a copy either through your Baird Financial Advisor or via BairdWealth.com. With that, thank you everyone for joining. Ross, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Justine, and and thanks everyone for taking some time today um, to listen to me talk about the markets and the economy. Um, we're we're going to kind of go through the thirty thousand foot view of everything, um, which I think is a, a useful exercise as we kick off a new year. Um, but yeah, so we're we're heading into twenty twenty three. I'll I'll uh, jump in and actually start with the long term view. I like to. Start talks about the markets and you know the the issues of the day with kind of why the long term perspective is important. Um, there's really nothing new under the sun. This is what the stock market uh, S and P 500 has done over roughly the last century, um, turning a thousand dollar initial investment into over 11 million. Um, this is despite pandemics, wars, inflation, things that we're dealing with now. Are, are things that we've seen before and dealt with. Um, the long-term perspective is the one that I always discuss a, a market outlook through, um, because while there are headwinds and while there are things that might shape the decisions that we make this year or in the next year, I think this is an important uh, kind of framework to keep in mind. There, there is no new headwind under the sun there. Um, they might take on different tints or shades or come from different corners of the globe, um, but all of these things on this on this graph are just a microcosm of things that you know were worrisome or fearsome at the time um, and yet 95 percent of every 10-year period going back a century is positive positive. and the other interesting thing is the last five years despite how bad 2022 was and you can see on the screen here all of the worst years for the s p 500 in the last century and how they've done one three and five years out um, despite how bad 2022 was, and it was a historically difficult year, just measuring by performance is one of the worst um, six or seven uh, in history. Um, the last five years, so 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, were actually really, really average. So between really strong years in 19, 20, 21, and then a, and then a big down year in 22, you end up right at what the long-term average for the market has been for the last century, which is a, li a little over 10% a year. Um, I think it's important to note that because it certainly didn't feel average. Um, you know, it didn't feel like average when the pandemic hit. It didn't feel like average when all the stimulus was dumped into the economy and the market was you know, running up, up and to the right. And it didn't feel like average last year when we had historic inflation, rapidly rising interest rates and geopolitical tensions, you know, basically every, everywhere you looked. But that's kind of the thing about investing, you know, from my perspective, is that um, it doesn't feel like average or everything feels bigger than it is in the moment. And then the market and the news cycle move on to the next headwind or tailwind. And the, the S&P 500 has continued on its journey upward 
S&P 500 company profits have done the same thing. And that's what really drives the market long term. Um, before I get into what's going on today, I do want to focus on this because I think just as a base case, if you were to not know anything about the economy, if you were not to know anything about the political situation or the geopolitical situation, you could say, well, how is the market done in the years following really bad years? You know, does, is, is there a mean reversion when the market has a historically bad year? And the data would say yes. So one year out, um, it's a bit mixed, but it, it's on average quite strong. And then three to five years out, there's basically no red left on the chart. So you have a really bad year like 2022. You turn on the news, you hear about all the headwinds still facing the economy and the markets. And yet, whether it's the Great Depression, uh, the stagflation era of the 70s, the dot-com bubble of 2002, when you have a year as difficult as 2022 was, you know you can look out from there and see light on the horizon, knowing nothing else about what's going on in the world. Um, I think this table is a good reminder that markets do tend to mean revert and that they're positive over longer periods of time. So this is pretty much the big show is inflation. It's It was a story of 2021, of 2022, and it will be the story of 2023 because of all the implications it has for corporate profits, for consumer spending, for how the, uh, the Federal Reserve acts and raises interest rates. Um, so we're gonna get into it. I think it's worth noting how we got here and where we really are. So this chart here is just inflation over the last five years. That peak is a 40 year high. And even today, at a much lower six and a half percent, which is the most recent reading, that would be a 40 year high uh, if you exclude the most recent year. So we're still at historically high inflation, which means that the Federal Reserve is gonna continue raising interest rates. Consumers are gonna continue to have to deal with that inflation. But on the positive end, it's headed in the right direction. It was a long, you know, 12 to 18 months of heading in the wrong direction, beating expectations to the upside, um, and ultimately culminating in a 9% inflation rate that hadn't been seen since the last great inflation. And really, a lot of investors that we work with hadn't experienced, you know, before. We've read about it, you've looked at the charts, but it's been a long time since the US and the globe has been dealing with an, a, a bout of inflation like we saw in last year. So the good news is it's heading down. The bad news is it's still pretty historically high and could remain a bit stickier than has been the case in the past. And for a few reasons we'll talk about, but wages are very upward sticky. It's hard to cut wages and there is a shortage of labor right now that is really acute uh, in the US economy. 60% um, of government spending is indexed to inflation. So if inflation is higher, government spending goes up and it's a self-reinforcing cycle. Things like tightness in commodity markets. You know, we haven't been um, drilling for, for oil and gas in the same way that we had before. Mining for things like copper, steel, um, you know, every sort of commodity that we can talk about. And that's an important input into our economy and into our output. Um, there's kind of a structural tightness in those markets. And so there are reasons to think inflation can be sticky, but there are also reasons to be really optimistic about inflation. And that's where I want to start. Um, number one, Commodity prices have eased. I, I've noted that, you know, things like oil markets are a lot tighter on the supply side. It's been a decade of underinvestment of kind of, you know, wagging our finger at, at you know, big oil and, and some of the fossil fuel producers. And they've they've pulled back and they've been a much uh, more efficient and tighter business. But in response, we simply have less oil in the world. Um, Russia being sanctioned hasn't helped that. OPEC plus, which controls a lot of the world's production, has been very tight. And yet, oil prices were up around 120, 130 a barrel um, just six to eight months ago. They've fallen pretty precipitously since then. What does this do? Well, this makes uh, consumers at the pump, their lives a lot easier. Gas prices are way down. Um, and what and that informs how people think about inflation and how they behave. So this, along with plenty of other commodities out there, have really come off the boil. Supply chain disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic have eased, so it's easier to get a hold of these things as well. Um, and that's a real boon to consumers. I, I, I put oil on the, you know, a chart of oil because I think gasoline prices are maybe one of the most critical inputs into how consumers think and act. And so if you've been out lately, you, you probably know that gas prices are down from over $5 a gallon, you know, closer to something like $3 a gallon. And that's meaningful. Um, for how consumers spend. We are a consumer economy. We 
don't make as many things as we used to. We go out and spend on goods and services. It's about 70% of our GDP. And so when the consumer has a little bit of extra wallet share, um, a little bit of extra room in their pockets, um, th things are in good shape. Another reason that the inflation picture is improving quite a bit is a ton of the reason that we had inflation in the first place was COVID-19. It was factories being shut down. It was transportation being shut down. Um, this chart shows what it cost basically to ship things from China to the US and Europe and back. And those lines that spike in early 2021 um, show that the cost of shipping something from China to the US jumped eight, nine, 10 times in less than a year. That is a borderline impossible environment to operate in if you're in the business of importing goods from China. And we import a lot of goods from China, semiconductors, pieces, uh, appliances, home furnishings. You know, if you tried to, um, or in the early days of the pandemic, if you were thinking you might redo your house or, or, or build that addition, you probably found it very difficult. Um, and a lot of the reason for that is this. We had shortages of key things and the things that we, we could ship, um, it cost an arm and a leg to get across the Pacific Ocean. And so that is basically normalized. And it's basically normalized before China shifted their policy in recent weeks to really reopen with the vengeance. And so we should see, there will be some hiccups along the way, but we really should see um, a return to normalcy, a return to pre-pandemic normalcy as far as shipping and transportation, trucking, getting goods from, from place A to place B. And that's a real boon. Uh, finally, housing is set to soften meaningfully. Um, another big story of the pandemic was the rapid rise in housing prices as people spread out across the country, work from home, new family formation. Um, what we're seeing right now is that in the inflation readings, in CPI, housing and rents are incorporated with a bit of a lag. That's the yellow line, so it's still pointed upwards. But if you look at any kind of real-time indicators, so for instance, Zillow, which is the, you know, the big home listing site, um, they basically track rents in real time. And what they're showing is that rents are rolling over and falling at a really dramatic pace as demand weakens, as uh, mortgage rates you know, have spiked. I think we're all aware of that, but it's become more expensive and harder to rent, harder to get a home. Um, and so prices are gonna have to soften as a result. They've already started to. This should be a real tailwind to inflation throughout 2023 because the official reading, I noted that it had come down from nine to six and a half percent and it's heading in the right direction. That's with housing, which is a massive percentage of CPI. It's a huge amount of where we spend our money is still heading upward. So we'll see a real tailwind from that um, heading into the new year. But, there is one place that the Federal Reserve is locked in on, and that is the labor market, and the labor market is still historically tight. So as a bit of precursor, the Federal Reserve is our central bank, and they basically have two jobs, maximum employment, try to keep people employed, and price stability, which is inflation. Well, on the inflation side of things, it's pretty easy to see that they've, they've failed somewhat dramatically over the past year and a half with inflation at 40-year highs. I don't attribute that all to them, but they were certainly slow to react. They have functionally one tool, and that is interest rates. They raise or lower a key interest rate that affects all the other interest rates throughout our economy. So when the Fed raises interest rates on their end, you see mortgage rates spike from 3% to 7%, as we saw last year. They raise interest rates to cool demand in the economy. This is important to note because Inflation is an imbalance in supply and demand. If there's the same amount of demand chasing no supply, the price of, of that supply is going to go up. On vice versa, if there's more demand chasing the same amount of supply, prices go up. It's, it's an imbalance there. What the Fed doesn't can do is control supply. They can't go pump more oil. They can't go build more houses. They can't plant more crops. All they can do is control demand. They try to raise rates cool the economy so people want to buy less things, things get more expensive to purchase, and they try to bring that back into balance. So that is what the Fed's doing. And what this chart shows is that every time they've done this over the past 50 years, they have not stopped raising interest rates until their, their key interest rate was above the rate of inflation. We are not there yet today. Um, 
that is kind of the minimum bar that most expect the Fed to have to clear. So they're somewhere around four and a half percent on their key interest rate and inflation is around six and a half percent. So they're going higher. Inflation is coming lower, but we're not there yet. And so the Fed is going to remain uh, in aggressive tightening mode. They're slowing, but they're not stopping. And they continue to if you follow any of the press, um, they continue to talk about how they want to get interest rates high and keep them there for quite a while. The biggest reason that they don't look at the inflation data that I just showed and say, well, we can probably stop now is because of the labor market. So obviously, if you run a business, a huge input on the cost side of things is what you pay your workers. Um, and what you pay, if you have to pay your workers more, the price of your product is probably going to cost more. If so facto, you get inflation. Um, the biggest problem in our economy today is that we are structurally short millions of workers um, from our, po our pre-pandemic trend. And that's what this is showing, is the labor force, basically anyone who's working or wants to work, what it was doing for the decade leading up to the pandemic, and then what happened post-pandemic. And we're missing a lot of workers from our economy. Now, there are a lot of theories and, and reasons that this might be the case. The, the most common and most widely accepted seems to be that there was a, a bulk of early retirements um, at the beginning of the pandemic um, for, I'm sure, a variety of reasons, health reasons, work from home reasons, uh, the stock market and housing market went up. So maybe you felt better about retiring a few years early. Um, immigration is down. People are staying out of the workforce because of COVID. Um, there, there are a lot of reasons. This is not a, a, a one-stop shop as far as solution to this problem. But when you have a structural shortage of workers, the workers that are left get paid more. They can demand higher, higher wages because you, there's nobody competing with them. They can go out and, and kind of name their price. And that's what we're seeing. Um, because of the shortage of workers, there are over 10 million job openings in our economy right now. That is well elevated from the past couple of decades. Um, it's been, that's a monthly reading. It's been over 10 million every month of 2022. And the general unemployment level is, is under 6 million. So there are, are fewer workers who are, are looking for work, willing to work, than there are job openings in the economy. And again, what does that lead to? Well, the number one thing it leads to, you know, in, in theory, and this is what the Fed is most worried about, is wage growth that is incompatible with their inflation target. Again, if you're a company and you're paying 10% year over year wage growth for a new employee, the price of whatever you're selling probably has to go up. Unless your new employee is that productive that they can do way more with less and keep your other costs down or even make your other costs go down, the likelihood is that the price of your product has to go up, the price of your service has to go up. If you've been out in the world uh, in the last couple of years, you know this is the case, whether it's travel, getting a haircut, um, any kind of service or good. Thing, things are more expensive and a big part of that is wage growth. Now, on one hand, we're a consumer economy, as I mentioned, people spend more when they're confident in their job situation. It's emphatically a good thing to have a strong labor market. But from the eyes of the Federal Reserve, who needs there to be less demand for labor to get to their inflation target, this is their number one problem that they're working on. What I show here is wage growth from job switchers versus job stairs. So if you're a person who stays at your job and gets your, your annual raise, um, things are pretty good. Cost of living raises were high. But where things are really, really good is if you're someone who switched jobs um, in the past couple of years. The gap between these two has widened. And again, the, the year over year wage growth for a job switcher in an economy where we're short workers and where there's over 10 million job openings is 8 9%. And again, that is not compatible with what the Fed's inflation target is, which is 2%. It's not even close. And so when you put all of this data together and you see the wage growth pre-COVID and post-COVID, which is what I'm showing on the screen here, and you know what the Fed needs to do and you know what they want to do and you hear them talking about the imbalance in the labor market, it all comes together to show that they're going to continue raising rates and being a little bit more aggressive than the headline inflation data might suggest. This to me is maybe the number one reason or, or, or risk to the market in my mind. Um, I don't think it's a huge risk, but in the past, the Federal Reserve has, has probably over-tightened interest rates 
and induced you know a slowdown or a recession in the economy. Um, I think that could be the case this year if they are laser focused on the wage data and not looking at some of the other things that have drastically improved and helped bring inflation down and, and should continue to come down meaningfully over the next several months. Um, so that's a, that's a lot on inflation in the labor market. I did you know want to take the other side of that, which is the labor market again is is people going to work, is people getting raises. On bulk, that's a great thing. I, that's what I want to see. Um, and people, are, we, we are seeing that. The, the Fed has raised interest rates as, as fast as they've done really in modern history, at least since the, the 1970s. And yet the unemployment rate is still three and a half percent, which is functionally a 50 year low. People are getting raises at a four or five percent clip. And while that might not be quite enough to keep up with the headline rate of inflation, it's still better than it's been um, any time in recent history. And as inflation continues to come down, that wage growth is, is pretty upward sticky and will be hard, um, will, will result in real gains uh, for a U.S. worker. The other thing that consumers and workers have going for them is there's a real cushion of savings out there in the aggregate kind of consumer economy. So between the pandemic stimulus, so stimulus checks, enhanced unemployment insurance, um, paycheck protection program, and then quite frankly, you know, wage growth and not being able to spend on much during the first year of the pandemic. You just, you really couldn't get out and spend on too much. Um, the consumer sector amassed trillions in excess savings. Um, some of that went into the stock market, some of it went into checking accounts, savings accounts, but we have only really started to draw down on that in the last year. And based on most calculations, there's still a trillion and a half to two trillion of savings in the consumer sector. Now it's not super evenly distributed, um, but it provides a cushion, you know, like I said, when the Fed is raising interest rates, usually we're heading towards an economic slowdown. That is, that cushion is not something that we usually get the benefit of um, as we head, you know, towards a slowdown or towards a recession. So between the strong labor market and a strong consumer position, um, there's a real tailwind at the back of the U.S. economy, even with all of the other headwinds um, that we're aware of, that we know about. And I think that's worth keeping in mind, you know, there's enough focus on the negative things uh, that are that are facing the economy. But the U.S. consumer is is still fairly flush with cash, still in a strong labor market position and still spending. So um, I had a, a chart in here that showed a, uh, an economic data point, retail sales. Um, but then I, I heard someone say that probably a better uh, read on how the consumer in the U.S. actually feels is look at the box office. And we have $3 billion movies this year. Um, and some of those are still rising rapidly. The reopening of the economy, going out and spending on services, spending on things that for a year and a half we couldn't spend on, for two years we couldn't spend on, going to the movies, traveling. I mean, if you've followed the news at all, you know that airlines are really struggling to keep up with the strong demand that they're facing. Um, and so particularly on the services side of things. So early in the pandemic, we spent on things like TVs and home furnishings, maybe a used car. Um, now that's shifted to services and that part of the economy remains um, really quite strong. And as an uh, indicator of how, how the consumer is doing, I think, again, it's, it's really emblematic that while things aren't perfect and while there are headwinds, um, people are still getting out and living their life and spending into the economy. And that, that meaningfully impacts both our economy and the stock market. Um, on the other hand, something like housing really struggling. And we know that the, the rise in mortgage rates from 3% to over 7% at one point basically froze the U.S. housing market. Um, I kind of mentioned up top why rents were coming down as demand slows. But on the other side of that coin, there is basically no new supply. Inventory of housing is incredibly low. It's incredibly constrained. Um, there's, there's not really been much building over the past couple of years. Um, partially because as mortgage rates spiked last year, demand dried up, um, but also because it's been really hard to source uh, labor, to source materials. Um, and so you functionally have housing, which is a big chunk of the U.S. economy, in a little mini recession of its own. So I think that's kind of the thing that, you know, if I could, if I could say one thing about the economy as we head into 2023, it's not a monolith. There are pockets that can do really well, pockets that can struggle. 
pockets that move at different paces. And so when you look at something like the box office or the services economy booming versus the housing market and contraction, um, I think it's worth, you know, it's, it's worth keeping in mind that when pundits talk about recession or talk about slowdown, um, there are a lot of different components worth factoring into that. And, and just to also point out, as the R word gets brought up a lot more, uh, recession, I would note that recessions more often than not over the last 75 years um, are, are mild. Um, this is just GDP year over year, so it's a pretty simple gauge of how the economy is doing. The last two recessions, so we have this recency bias where we, you know, we, we think of the things that are easier to call to mind. The last two recessions, 2008, 2020, were two of the deepest and most damaging since World War II, basically. Um, before that, it's not that we didn't have recessions, it's just that they could be much milder drawdowns in the economy. So if I had to provide a base case for what I think is going to happen in 2023, given what the U.S. consumer position is, given how strong the labor market is, I think you'll see a slowing. The Fed is intentionally engineering one. Higher interest rates lead to that. But I don't think it has to be a cataclysmic recession. I think it can be a mild slowdown. Um, some people would call that a, a soft landing in the economy versus a hard landing recession. And, you know, if you think back, you know, further than the most recent two, um, that was that was fairly common. It was it was probably a lot more typical. So that's kind of my base case as we move into the year. Um, coming up on on 30 minutes here, um, I'll do a bit of a grab bag on other things we're thinking about where we're thinking about investing for the year. I think one theme that could be really pertinent in 2023 is international over U.S. Um, for the better part of a decade, if not longer, U.S. stocks, U.S. assets have outperformed international and pretty handily. Um, so far this year, we're seeing that reverse. So this is the last three months of Europe versus the U.S. Um, and Europe is up you know, there's a huge gap there, 20% gap in what Europe has done. Um, Japan has been doing well. The Chinese economy is reopening. We'll talk about that. Um, but a few things here I think are really important. So number one, the dollar, the US dollar, which is the world reserve currency, is falling pretty dramatically. And when the US dollar falls, international assets or US companies that have a lot of international business tend to outperform. Um, and so we're seeing that this year. Uh, that's definitely been a big theme so far. The other things that we're seeing is, well, in Europe in particular, the energy crisis that was feared when Russia invaded Ukraine has not materialized. Now, part of that is just it's been a really mild winter. They haven't had to tap uh, gas supply or, or really lean hard on energy uh, supply that wasn't there. So that's been a big tailwind. Um, the other thing is that they're their economy, the businesses that are in Europe are a lot different from the ones that are in the US. They don't have a big tech sector the way we do. They don't um, have a big concentration in tech stocks. They're much more concentrated in value and cyclical stocks, things like banks and energy and defensive companies, things like consumer staples, um, you know, kind of kind of retailing companies. And those have been outperforming. We like those to continue to outperform. And so just the mix, the sector mix could be a real tailwind for Europe and develop markets more broadly. Um, and so this is a theme that we think, while, while it might not be a new five to 10 year period of outperformance from, from Europe and from other developed international markets, um, we think it has some legs for this year. And something I talk about all the time, there's, there's a, a home country bias, which is we live in the US. As investors, we tend to overweight US stocks. If you go to Australia, Australian investors tend to overweight Australian stocks, even though Australian stocks are, you know, a fraction of the overall stock market. This basically holds wherever you go. Um, and so I think it's always worth revisiting that bias and making sure we're not super overweight U.S., having that global diversification, but especially at a, at a time like this where international is starting to look more attractive. I mentioned that we're a little bit still, you know, nervous about big tech and the big tech uh, sector here, which has been under a lot of pressure of late, and why that might lead to European outperformance. Um, I would note that last year, the the big tech sector, or the big the big five that are at the top of the market, 
we're about a quarter of the stock market. Five companies represented about a quarter of the overall stock market. That's come down quite a bit, but it is still well elevated versus, you know, the last 40 or so years. So we think that those stocks could continue to face headwinds. They're facing new regulation. Um, pretty much, there's very few bipartisan things uh, on Washington these days, but one of them is tech regulation. Um, and then more broadly, when there's just a big kind of asset bubble like we saw at the end of 21, it can take quite a while to work itself out. If you use the dot-com bubble as kind of a comparison point, it took the better part of a decade for, for big tech and for growth stocks to regain some, some semblance of leadership from value stocks, from energy, from banks. And so, you know, the, the amount of time that might take is unknown, but I do think that that could, that could persist into 2023. Uh, finally, I think China is a is a big wild card or maybe under discussed story at this point. Um, everyone knows that they they've shifted from zero COVID to reopening, but they've done so in in such a rapid and dramatically fast pace um, that I don't think markets are are quite ready uh, for for all of the implications. You know, if you think about what U.S. reopening is like, and I'm you know mentioned the U.S. box office, so you think about travel, one our lockdowns were not as bad, nor were they as long. And two, we came out of them way earlier. Um, China has pursued a really stringent COVID zero policy for a long time to the point where there were protests for the first time in, in quite a long time um, in their country. They've reversed all of that, you know, functionally overnight. And so there will be bumps and bruises, but there will be a lot of ramifications this year on the demand side over a billion people kind of re-entering as consumers, but also as, as companies are able to you know, fire up their factories with the gusto. Um, this shows kind of China imports are really the Chinese economy versus commodity prices. And when there's China demand, um, commodity prices tend to rise because they are the factory of the world still. And they take a lot of commodities as inputs into manufacturing goods. So this could be a headwind for the Federal Reserve as they fight inflation, if this helps boost prices for things like oil, prices for things like steel, copper. And we've already seen some of those industrial metals pop a little bit in the last few weeks. Um, but it will also provide a real tailwind for global growth. There will be a whole cohort of, of Chinese consumers who have not been able um, to consume, quite frankly, for a couple of years or more. And that's going to be a really interesting dynamic to watch play out. It also should, again, on the supply chain front, really help ease any remaining pressure there. Um, you know, factories had been getting shut down there as recently as fourth quarter of last year. Um, that sort of thing should should kind of fade to the back. Um, with China, you know, thinking about China, with China in focus, um, one big policy theme that I, I thought is worth hitting on as we move into 2023 is the idea of of a shift from globalization to a more deglobalized world. Um, this is our trade with China and, and rest of world. And you can see our trade with China um, has, has not recovered where we were um, prior to the trade war and, and particularly uh, prior to the, the March 2020 pandemic. Um, we are doing less business with China. It's a bit more adversarial at this point. And there's a lot of ramifications for a deglobalizing and increasingly multipolar world, um, including overall trade rolling over or, or slowing from really four decades of growth from the 1980s. Um, what sort of things does that mean? It means policy, uh, policymakers allocating funds to bring supply chains back to the United States or to more friendly countries. It means uh, tech export controls. It means review of outbound investment from US companies that want to do business um, in places that are deemed national security threats like China. Um, it means a lot of those things. And we think that that trend is really just kind of on the cusp. Um, it's a very, it, it's like turning around a cruise ship. It's a slow trend. There are too many inextricable links for it to, to ever reverse fully, um, but it is one worth watching um, after really, again, decades of globalization being the kind of predominant economic growth driver, cheaper access to labor, cheaper access to labor internationally. 
a much broader consumer base for U.S. companies to sell their products and services to. Um, should that shift, there will be there will be ramifications. And I mentioned that tech regulation was one of the few kind of bipartisan ideas in Congress right now. Um, another one is uh, onshoring or bringing home um, national security relevant or critically relevant industries and so and their supply chains. So we found out between COVID-19 pandemic and between um, Russia-Ukraine war, that we have some pretty critical infrastructure and supply chains in places um, that are a bit at risk um, in a way that's, that's uncomfortable from a national security perspective. And so our spending on domestic manufacturing is up. Um, the U.S. Chips and Science Act, which passed last year, allocated north of 50 billion uh, to bring semiconductor manufacturing back to the United States. Our policy team uh, at Strategus in-house here at Baird expects several other industries, biotech, uh, PPE, to, to come back home as well over the next several years. Again, as one of the few bipartisan ideas in Congress, um, there could be a lot of work done on that over the next two years. And I think there are ramifications for energy as well. Um, you're not seeing quite the momentum there yet, but I think it'll pick up. Um, but the U.S. has all of the resources to be energy independent, um, and we can make that happen if, if we make the right policy choices. So I think you'll start to see some of that as well. But again, bringing home critical infrastructure, critical supply chains, critical um, production of, of things like oil um, is a really important theme to keep an eye on, and it'll, it'll play out. It, it's not a one, two-year theme. That's a, a longer-term idea. Um, finally, I'll end uh, with a little bit of talk on DC. Uh, really, the, the, the thing of note for me is this combination of party in Congress and the White House has been historically quite strong. Um, there was an idea that there could be some gridlock, which is usually beneficial to markets. I think that will largely be true, that there won't be really new taxes or, or new spending that might be perceived as inflationary. But the one place to keep an eye on is the debt ceiling, and that will likely be a fight that evolves over the next six months and could get quite volatile. Um, there's not a clear off ramp yet. Um, this isn't the first time, nor will it probably be the last time this happens, but it provides a lot of headlines, a lot of headline kind of fears, um, a lot of you know partisan stoking, which as investment uh, professionals and investors, we try to leave out of our decision making, but it will um, probably cause some market volatility and investors just need to be prepared for that. Um, again, our policy team at Strategus has noted that oftentimes that that volatility in the markets is the catalyst that the policymakers need to get something done. And so um, we'll just keep an eye on it. There are off ramps. There will likely be a deal made. We don't expect the U.S. to default, um, but it could be rocky along the path to get there. And that will really be a summer or fall story anyway. I'll, I'll end here kind of where I started, which is a long term setup starting to look pretty attractive uh, to us. So these two charts are forward uh, price to earnings multiple on stocks and then yield on fixed income. And it's kind of a kind of a messy chart. But what this shows is that where stocks sit today, historically, based on how they're being you know, valued, um, you could expect about an eight to 10 percent annual return for five years. On fixed income, basically whatever your starting yield is, it is pretty gets pretty close to what your long term return is. So if you can expect, you know, eight, nine, ten percent on stocks, which is what, again, just what the Ford P has said about past performance. And if you can get three and a half, four percent on a treasury, which is again just what the the yields are today, um, that's a pretty attractive setup for a 60-40 portfolio. And um, we wrote this at the end of last year when 6040 has a really bad year. And 2022 was for a 6040, you know, which is 60% stocks and 40% bonds. When it has a year like last year, which is a historically difficult year, the forward returns tend to be quite strong. Um, you get reversal in yields that prop up fixed income, and you have a reset of valuations that are really beneficial for stocks. So if you think longer term, three, five, 10 years down the road, and I'm optimistic about the next 12 months, but I'm a lot more confident in a longer term outlook. Things look are starting to look really attractive to us. 
Um, I'll end here I'll, and I'll leave this up as I take questions, but Warren Buffett has a quote that I like. He says, if you aren't willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't think about it, owning it for 10 minutes. Um, basically the idea of, of being a long-term investor, letting a long-term you know, thesis play out. And if you look at what the US stock market has done on a given day, it's basically a coin flip. But if you got 10 years, it's positive and it's been positive 95% of the time. Wars, pandemics, inflation, unrest, whatever it might be, um, that has held for the last century. And so I think it's worth you know remembering as we have the news on and, and the, the whatever of the day starts to you know weigh on us, um, I think the long-term perspective is really important in times like this. So um, I will turn it back to Justine for Q&A. Um, but I appreciate everyone's time today and, and can't wait to get to some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Ross. We really do appreciate it. I've seen quite a few questions come in already, but I will remind our audience, if you do have a question, please feel free to click that Q&A icon on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Um, just when you hit send, please make sure you're hitting send to all panelists. Um, Ross, I'm going to start out with a couple. There was a few questions around you mentioning immigration being down. Are you meaning immigration of professional immigrants, those employable being down, or just in general? Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so when, when I'm talking about that, I'm using kind of a 30,000 foot view of immigration being down. And quite frankly, it, it is a little bit of both. Um, both, you know, kind of your your visa, um, you know, professional white collar type, and those who would be taking more you know, blue collar jobs. Um, it's down across the board. And it's not a new trend, which is why I think that in particular, it like, if you look at the chart, it's basically been going down since 2017, 2018. And with with consistency across administration, I would note, um, I think it, it's playing into the labor shortage. But because it's been a bit of a longer term trend, it's not the primary cause of the labor shortage post pandemic. I think that has a lot more to do with early retirement and um, and and some other COVID issues. But it's it's across the board. I, you know, to look at that, we're just using kind of a thirty thousand foot view. And again, it's been ticking down um, since since about twenty seventeen, if I recall correctly. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there's a comment in here about the new legislator and any thoughts on the debt ceiling impacting investment strategies with the new legislator? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think there's going to be some some market volatility um, around this. The, the comp that I've seen most often, um, because this happens all the time, but it's not always as messy. Um, the 2011 debt ceiling crisis is one that I've seen referenced by a couple of different strategists, including our our own policy experts at Strategus. Um, and that one was quite contentious. It uh, The market really tumbled as that was happening and companies linked to government spending really tumbled because there was a, a genuine sense that something would happen. And if you'll re recall, the U.S. credit rating was downgraded during that um, during that event. But, you know, I, I guess the, the view I take on stuff like that is I wouldn't change my strategy, but I would be prepared for heightened volatility. And oftentimes, it you know, it can be a lot harder to stick with a, a strategy during those moments. Um, and it's, you know, to, to just to be quite honest, like the news reporting around it will get and probably already is pretty fatalistic about what the implications of defaulting on U.S. debt are. Um, so it, it will probably feel pretty scary, but I wouldn't change an investing strategy, I would just be prepared for that volatility and particularly the headline volatility that's going to be associated with it. Because again, in those moments, the, the policymakers that, that are cutting the deals usually need a catalyst to get something done. And a lot of times it is financial market volatility that can pressure them uh, to, to the table when they really don't want to be there. Great. Thank you. Um, there's always conversation going around around about, you know, increasing U.S. debt, mm -hmm. anything that you see from your end to an end game pertaining to this whole debt conversation? Well, I think, you know, in the in the, the debt ceiling crisis that we're talking about right now, um, the House Republicans want pretty meaningful spending cuts uh, as part of what they want to bring to the table to make a deal. Um, 
Democrats will 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 fight against that. But in the you know spending cuts were made in the 2011 uh, debt ceiling crisis. I think I think broadly, um, I don't worry about the U.S. debt kind of as a monolith. Um, but interest rates are up, servicing that debt is getting more expensive, and as tax receipts, which have been really really up partially because of inflation, partially because of the reopening economy, as those start to, to slow or flatline, um, I think you'll start to see a little bit more kind of austerity out of the federal government. So that would probably be the, the thing that I, I think would be the most immediate impact would be less big government spending bills, especially um, deficit financed ones. Um, and particularly now that uh, Congress is split down the middle. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a, an investing strategy, you know, that, that plays on that. But I do think, you know, the debt and, and particularly the cost of servicing the debt with interest rates at multi-decade highs will be a talking point. It probably will um, juice some of the conversation around spending cuts, and it'll probably keep the federal government from, from doing any kind of big legislation that's deficit financed, uh, you know, in the near term. Awesome. Thank you, Ross. Um, there's a comment in here. So interest rates are going up. Companies are facing labor challenges. Why is this not the time to invest in bonds or would there be a signal to shift more into investing towards bonds? I think it's a great time to invest in bonds. I mean, for those with a, a longer term outlook, at, you know, the, the growth potential of stocks and the capital appreciation and uh, dividends there are, are still probably more attractive just because that's been the long term history. But you know, investors and, and savers really have been, you know, I don't want to say punished, but they haven't been able to get yield in a decade plus. And for the first time in a long time, you can get really, really attractive yield on high quality, you know, government debt or corporate debt. Um, the long term, I think the 10 year inflation expectation is something like 2% which means that if you invest in a 10 year treasury today, you're getting a, a real above inflation yield return um, that is attractive and is going to is going to draw in money that would have, you know, gone into stocks without thinking twice about it over the last decade and provide real competition uh, to stocks. I think, you know, it depends on your plan and your time horizon, but I, I certainly think that um, investing in fixed income, grabbing some yield while it's here is not the worst idea. Now, again, I'll, I would say lean on your financial advisor and the plan and the portfolio strategy you already have in place. Um, but I, you know, it, it, it's been hard to get excited about fixed income over the past decade. Um, and it's still, you know, three and a half, four percent on the 10 year treasury, but that is a meaningful upgrade from what we've had. So um, and then high quality corporates, you know, you can you can start to leg up a little bit higher than that. So I think it's I think it's a good time to to look at fixed income, um, especially for savers or people who are, you know, living on sort of a kind of fixed income. Um, you mentioned, you know, you think 2023 will be an okay year. There's a couple comments in here around recessions. Um, do you see a recession first half of the year, second half, not at all? What are your thoughts? I, I think if I had to put a base case on it, I would say, we probably have flat growth um, and, and no recession, um, at least not in 2023. I think the labor market and consumer are in too good of a picture and, uh, and the global growth situation is turning up in a way that will help support the US economy, um, again, particularly China. Um, but I don't think it's gonna be, you know, as far as GDP growth, which is, you know, kind of the rule of thumb, are we in a recession or not? I, it's not going to be a banner year. It's going to be more more likely than not below the long-term trend. Um, and that's what the Fed needs, you know, to get inflation under control. But I, it, I don't think it's going to be a gangbusters year um, at all. But I do think there's enough strength in really important pockets of the economy that we avoid a recession or you know, there's a, there's a, a body of economists that decides whether technically we've entered a recession or not. If, if with hindsight, they end up calling a recession that happened at some point in 2023, my guess would be that it is, is such a mild version of that. Um, 
you know, that it's not something that, you know, would register on, on the Richter scale of, of recession. So I'm uh, pretty optimistic. I think, I think especially um, because of how the picture in Europe and China is playing out, I think there's a real kind of lift to global growth from outside the U.S., but that will have um, some spillover effects for our, for our companies and for, for exports, um, things like that. Great. Thanks, Ross. This next question, I know we could probably spend a whole day talking about it, but could you comment a little bit on um, how does less government spending ultimately end up impacting the economy? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, just like any other entity or body, I mean, the government employs individuals, they participate in the in the economy. You know, I mentioned the, the Chips and Science Act. Um, 50 billion plus, maybe close to 75 billion to those companies to bring supply chains back to the US and build manufacturing uh, capabilities here. So, you know, I mean, number one on G, if you go to the, uh, if you go to the official government GDP reporting, it breaks it out into four kind of components. And one of them is government spending. And so there's a direct input of fiscal money into the economy and it shows up in our growth. It, it, they're just very much a, a player in the market economy, the government is. Um, but there's, they're, they're not not going to be spending. The, the, I think the, the bigger issue would be is are they writing big bills that are somewhat deficit financed or are they, you know, spending um, in a more kind of, I guess what you would call responsible or, or fiscally conservative way. I think that will probably continue. You know, we're still they, uh, the the government just passed a one point seven dollar one point seven trillion dollar omnibus bill in December that has increases in defense spending and non defense spending. Um, so long term, if the if the government really you know tightens up, it could have it will it will have an impact on economic growth. Um, but I, I don't think that there's going to be like a full stopping of the train. Perhaps just a a slowing, especially if interest rates stay high and, um, you know, the cost of servicing the national debt um, or paying the interest expense um, starts to rise up the, you know, their their budget, their line items. So, um, so, so to, to sum it up, I mean, they, they very much are a player in the market economy, um, but the extent to which um, they're slowing down, I don't know that it's going to create a, a massive drag on economic growth. Great, thanks, Ross. Um, maybe one last question here. There's a comment about um, all these layoffs being announced in the news, and then the graph that you showed regarding the labor shortage and the salary bump for job hoppers. Mm -hmm. Any specifics that would make sense as to why there's layoffs, but then also, you know, this growing labor shortage and salary bump for job hoppers? Yeah, so uh, a few things on that. So, number one, you know, most of the, the big layoffs and the headlines have been kind of concentrated in the tech sector. Um, and so, first and foremost, that sector of the economy, I think, represents something like two or three percent of total employment. Um, so it gets the headline because the companies are really big and really well known. Um, you know, they're big weights in the stock market. But as far as employers, they're actually not they're not huge employers versus um, you know, some of the other sectors, you know, education, manufacturing, that sort of thing. Um, and so when you see a headline today, like, I, I believe it was Microsoft announced maybe 10,000 people being laid off. That I think was less than 5% of their workforce, but also they are more of a, a drop in the bucket of overall US employment. So I think when you're thinking about the, the big tech names that you're used to hearing about all the time, because they're big stock weights, it's just worth keeping in mind that they're actually a much smaller weight on overall employment. The other thing is, and it's, it's um, you know, this might slow, but all of the evidence so far has been that the people that are laid off in that sector have not had the hardest time finding new employment in that sector, um, probably because there are job openings. Now maybe they had to move, maybe maybe they're new, maybe they weren't getting the, the big wage growth, but um, that, it's it's not kind of um, you're laid off and then you're you know um, 
you're really, really struggling to find work, at least in that specific sector. Um, the final thing I would say is in that sector, in tech and growth, I think there is somewhat of an understanding that there was a bit of over hiring when things looked really, really good post pandemic. Um, when it looked like Amazon, when nobody was going to go back to malls and Amazon was going to need X amount. As the world has kind of renormalized, maybe more to an extent than people expected, particularly in that sector, um, I think there's a bit, as opposed to signaling a deep recession, I think it's maybe more of an unwinding of overly optimistic outlook. Um, now, in the end, unemployed people, you know, are unemployed people, and it's it's not what you want. But I do think, as far as using that as kind of a read on the overall economy, um, I don't think we're I don't think that's quite the right way to look at it. Um, but I do think it's a sign that that sector is still going to, it still faces a lot of challenges, um, in the next couple of years to kind of right size, um, their businesses. And, you know, we talked about that a little bit. Well, thank you, Ross. This has been absolutely fantastic. I think I will close out here. Thank you everyone, um, on the line for your time today. We really do appreciate it. Just a reminder to view today's presentation or listen to the recording or share it with anyone. It will be available in about a week following today's webinar. You can get that through your Baird Financial Advisor or via BairdWealth.com. If we were unable to address your question or you would like additional information, again, I'd ask that you reach out to your Baird Financial Advisor and they will pull in the appropriate resources for you to continue that conversation. So with that, thank you everyone. Ross, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it.